building way back in 1993 when I was in Huntsville, Alabama. That's where Werner Von Braun had the Saturn V program for our country. I finished it 15 years later in Las Cruces, New Mexico, uh, just on the other side of the Oregon Mountains from White Sands uh, Missile Range, which that's where Werner Von Braun was at after World War II and bringing his V2s and starting our, our, our rocket program for this country. So it's kind of apropos in terms of the starting and ending of, of this pad and getting it constructed. It's totally operational. So what you're going to see during the countdown, I'm going to have the actual audio of the Apollo 11 countdown as part of this as well, too. And uh, it's going to start with, uh, with uh, John F. Kennedy's speech at Rice University back in September of 1962, uh, declaring the goal for our nation uh, for landing on the moon by the end of the decade. Then I have some audio from the Apollo 8 mission, which was our very first time we went to the moon and we orbited around it back in Christmas Eve of 1968. And then I have some audio uh, from the landing of Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. And uh, our special guest here, our guest of honor, of course, was the lead flight director for that landing. So he's going to talk to us about that just before we start this countdown. And then oh, there's a little audio. Um, Neil Armstrong stepping foot on the moon and then from there we're going to go into the countdown. But as I said, everything is operational. You're going to see the crane move into launch position, the white room swing arm, the swing arms for the Saturn V. There's pre-ignition motors that are going to go off at a roughly four seconds before launch to simulate the ignition of the F1 engines that it took to get this thing off the ground. There were five of those liquid propellant F1 engines producing 1.5 million pounds of thrust. A lot of thrust, the most powerful engines really ever produced. This is the most powerful machine ever produced by man. Not this one, but the real live version. <laughs> this one's only four feet tall. The real deal stood over 300 feet. Which, when you think about that, if you lay that down on a football field, it would go from end of one end zone to the end of another. It was huge. It was mammoth. But that's what it took to get us to the moon back then. And as I said, we're just really honored and privileged to have Gene here today to talk to us about his experience and being a part of that. And uh, it's really special to have you scouts here today. This is a precision duration competition that you're participating in. And we selected precision because it required a lot of precision back then to get us to the moon. So you're a part of that today with this event. And Gene, it's my honor and privilege to introduce you, Gene Kranz. This is the, uh, the second of Steve's event, and he keeps me busy every time I show up here. I have I arrived about two and a half days ago, and uh, last night for the first time I got a chance to sit down to get a couple beers with the wife. Uh, but uh, that's the name of the game. Uh, Dave was talking about the uh, the Saturn. This uh, I launched uh, five of the Saturns in the Apollo program, and uh, that is some event. It takes uh, you see the model out here. The uh, five engines they've got down at the base consume three tons of propellant each per second. Okay, the turbo pumps that are moving that propellant are 55,000 horsepower pumps. So they're moving that fuel through that entire column from the tanks down into the engines. And uh, to me, watching a Saturn launch is a visceral event. Uh, during launch, the flight director had responsibility for any abort related to the spacecraft systems. The launch director had the responsibility for an abort if he saw a collision with any part of the launch tower. So basically, it was a dual responsibility during the, about the first 10 seconds of powered flight. And once the Saturn cleared uh, the tower, the launch tower, then it was the flight director's responsibility for the rest of the mission. In mission control, we split the responsibility for abort in three pieces. Uh, the flight director had the responsibility for all the systems uh, requirements, any, any abort from a system standpoint. The trajectory officer made the calls once we had decided to abort, but it wasn't time critical so that we would abort and place the spacecraft down in one of our landing areas where we had recovery forces. Uh, the booster engineer had the responsibility for the abort in case the engines went hard over because and the, and the rocket would start tumbling during flight because we had tension ties that attached the spacecraft to the upper stage of the rocket. And basically it was about a 20 seconds decision time once this thing started in tumbling motion before you'd have structural failure. So the booster engineer had responsibility for abort. My trajectory 
re officer had responsibility and I had it. So that's what it was all about. It took 10 seconds to clear that tower. And you got a pretty good at uh, saying a lot of prayers in those first 10 seconds because <laughs> once you got past that tower, uh, the crew was on the way. A few words about the, uh, the uh, lunar landing. I was the flight director for the uh, first lunar landing. Had a, a team of between 15 and 21 controllers. Average age was 26 in mission control. I was the oldest guy in mission control that day. And uh, as the uh, time, you do a maneuver in the backside of the moon, which actually starts uh, slowing down the lunar module so that the moon's gravity is now pulling it towards the surface. And as it approaches 50,000 foot altitude, we then make a go-no-go -no -go whether we want to continue this descent, again start the lunar module engine, which will further slow it down and allow gravity to bring it down to the surface. Uh, the day that we uh, started this process, we had, <laughs> it was just like our worst training day. As soon as the spacecraft cracked the hill, we had all kinds of communications problems. It was so bad we couldn't communicate with the crew in the lunar module. So we had to relay instructions via Mike Collins. About that time, my trajectory officer tells me that we're halfway to our board limit radio velocity. And the word abort is not used casually in mission control during any mission, particularly one going down to the surface of the moon. Uh, we had, as I said, electrical problem, communications problem continued. We continued the descent. And as we're getting roughly around about, uh, uh, about 30,000 feet, we start looking for radar because the ground is updated, told the computer on board uh, the altitude above the moon, but that could be an error up to about 5,000 feet. And that is not good enough to land in the moon. So basically we had to get radar data, and about that time we started seeing a series of computer program alarms. Uh, the computer program alarms are too tight. There is what they call a uh, bailout, where basically the computer would uh, move into a cycle where it would only do the priority things. If you got a lot of bailout alarms, you'd go to PUDU, program goes to computer goes to halt. Basically, you've aborted the mission. You have to relaunch and go back and re-rendezvous with the command module. We now know we're going to be landing downrange several miles, so the crew is going to have to pick over a landing spot, work around craters, etc. And now we're starting to suck air in mission control because uh, in the, we did not, we are not able to measure a fuel quantity to the bottom of the tank. It's sort of like driving your car in empty, where basically the gauge gets down there and we know we got about two minutes of fuel remaining at about a 30% power level. So now we're counting the seconds of fuel remaining once we pass that low level point. At the time we landed on the moon, we had less than 17 seconds of fuel remaining, and we were process, in the process of getting ready and counting down to a very difficult and very risky land abort decision. But uh, the day we hit the moon, we did it. We got the crew down there, and it was interesting. Uh, everybody's celebrating my team's going to work because we now have to make a series of stay-no-stay -no -stay decisions over the next two hours. So we did not begin our celebration until we finished our shift two hours later. It's up to you. We've got ready to launch. How are we in the launch preps? We are good to go. Sir. Okay, good to go. All right. Pass it off to our communication. Thank you. Thank you, team. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. All the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. 
Yeah, just kick tired. Just sure. a little. So yeah, that's it. And this is okay. So I just have to redo that one. That's going to be easy enough. So yeah. that's Minor good. Damage. What caused what caused the pitch over there, which is interesting? I think, probably the center I think, of pressure. Uh, I think the E15 probably needs a, just a skosh more nose weight. Yeah. Is that right? right yeah, a little bit of a spillity, was, stability yeah, thing, yeah. Did yeah. I check it the other day? I mean, I did the string test. I mean, that's what I did to test it. It seemed to fly. Anyway. <laughs> As I said, yeah. this was the equivalent. I think it was either 501 or 502 where he lost an engine. And the guy who went to the Kai Freeze in second stage continued vertical, but then recognizes that it doesn't want to go vertical, it wants to go horizontal. So all of a sudden it pitches down, starts coming back down to the ground. And said, no, this ain't what we want. <laughs> so he went through a series of whiffer mills, which actually uh, was a great test of the integrity of the structural integrity of the uh, S2 and S4 stages there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. All right, well, you the lunch for you. Sure. Let me find a place here and I'll find a place to... Here's a table. <laughs> yeah, this is Ghost War Nose Way. Ghost War Nose Way would help. Yeah. But it was okay. <laughs> yeah, it got off the ground. It got off the ground. Well, I'm not... Or he's just trying right. to push it. He's just sort of fishing. You know what I need to get organized for the next Yeah, I've got, I've got standings here. Okay. okay. 